Hello, and welcome to Making Redux Easy with Toolkit. I'm your host, Jordan Winslow, and I will be leading you through this JavaScript adventure. Just kidding, guys. I'm not going to speak like that the whole time, but now that I've got your attention, Redux Toolkit is going to change the way that you think about Redux. It's going to make you realize that Redux is not something that is only feasible for large-scale corporate applications with super complicated state. It can be used even with tiny little applications like this one. This is a flashcard application that we will be sort of building together. I'm not going to go through every little step in making this because there's a lot more going on than just Redux Toolkit, and I want to just make this video centered around Toolkit. Uh, but basically, we're creating a simple CRUD application, C-R-U-D, Create, Read, Update, Delete. And basically, what you'll be able to do is you'll have a title on a flashcard, you'll have some content, and then you'll flip that guy over, and you'll have another title and some more content. And then you'll be able to delete flashcards if you don't like them. And you'll be able to click next and previous to get to the next and previous cards. And you'll be able to create new ones and type whatever your heart desires. And then flip the card over, type the content on the back. And now we have our new cards. So very simple, basic little application, open source. Go ahead and go to the GitHub repo located in the YouTube description. You can follow along by cloning the repository. And uh, this video assumes that you have kind of a basic understanding of how Redux works, or at least a basic understanding of why you don't like it. <laughs> um, and we are going to address why Redux is actually awesome and why Toolkit makes it so much easier to use and eliminates most of the common concerns, such as configuring a Redux store is too complicated. I have to add a lot of packages to get Redux to do anything useful. And Redux requires too much boilerplate. Those are definitely the main concerns. Same concerns that I had when I first started using Redux, actually. And the odd thing is there's just not very many videos out there who, that are actually talking about Toolkit. And uh, so a lot of people don't even know that it exists and, and don't realize that Redux can essentially be used for quite simple applications like this. And it only took me about a day to set up this entire project. Now, I'm going to go ahead and since I've written basically a script here, I'm going to stick to that. And uh, I'm not going to read it verbatim because obviously you guys can read and you can go ahead and go to the Notion link, which will also be in the description if you'd like to read along and just read the blog post instead. But yeah, so let's go ahead and begin and not uh, waste your, any more of your time. So Redux Toolkit is the official opinionated batteries included tool set for Redux development. And uh, it's intended to be the standard way to write Redux logic at this point. The core benefits of using it over vanilla Redux, I have summarized to three bullet points. Now, this is my personal opinion. You can go on over to the actual Redux Toolkit uh, .js .org website, and you can read you know, what they have to say about it as well. This is kind of my own opinion, my own views. And... Uh, so yeah, I expect a little bit of my own personal bias. So uh, Redux Toolkit majorly reduces boilerplate with powerful helper functions. It includes popular middleware and dev tools with no setup required. And it makes code more readable, testable, and easier to reason about. So let's cover those a little bit more in detail. The main two helper functions that are going to change the way that you think about Redux in my personal opinion, are create, slice, and configure store. Redux Toolkit comes with many more functions other than this to assist you in your development strategy. But these two, from my experience, have been the main drivers of innovation for my application state. So create store, let's, let's or configure store, let's go ahead and talk about that one first, since that's what you'll typically do. First is you'll make a Redux store. Um, in the past, you'd use create store and you'd make a middleware array and you'd fill it with all your middleware and then you'd use apply middleware and compose and you'd use all these functions 
and you do all this stuff and it's basically impossible to remember off the top of your head unless you're doing it every single day. And um, eventually you get a Redux store set up. Well, with Configure Store, it basically eliminates the need for you to create a separate root reducer file by allowing you to pass in each slice of your state, which would be your separate reducers in vanilla Redux, as an object. And then it runs combined reducers automatically for you. And in addition to that, it runs dev, it sets up dev tools for you. So compose with dev tools and all that shenanigans is running under the hood. And it gets Redux dev tools, the Chrome extension, if you're unfamiliar, set up for you, which is very, very powerful. Check it out immediately if you haven't heard of it yet. And it installs some popular middleware for you. And I'll talk about that in the next drop down. Uh, and then we have create slice, which eliminates the need for constants and types, as well as action creators. In old fashioned Redux, if you watch my previous video on Redux Toolkit, which kind of goes over the, the overlying reasons why it's awesome, uh, I talk a little more in depth about this. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of assume you already know uh, what all of this is and, and why this is a benefit. So we basically eliminate the need for constants and types and we eliminate the need for action creators by simply taking in an initial state object, which is filled with reducer functions, the name of that slice of state, and then it automatically creates all of the action creators and types for you, and you simply export them, and they can be used anywhere in the application. We'll cover that in more detail shortly. It includes popular middleware and dev tools, no setup required. So it prevents common mistakes such as accidentally mutating your state or putting non-serializable data into state such as functions or promises, which should be handled separately from the state logic. Now it does this by including the middleware Redux immutable state invariant. Yeah, that's pretty hard to memorize. If you like to do things off the top of your head, you're probably gonna have to look it up, not with Redux Toolkit. It just runs this under the hood automatically. And what Redux Immutable State Invariant does for you is it prevents you, it, it throws errors whenever you try to mutate the state directly. And uh, that's probably not gonna happen because uh, it also runs Immer under the hood, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Now, another popular middleware that it includes is serializable state invariant, which prevents you from putting things, as I said, like functions and promises into the state. And uh, so we, we should probably use things like Redux Thunk or something else to handle those sort of things. And it also allows you to manage your side effects with Redux Thunk, which is pretty much the most simple middleware for doing asynchronous actions such as fetch requests, things like that, um, you know, interacting with APIs and uh, basically anything that has a side effect. And a side effect, if you're not familiar with functional programming paradigms, is uh, basically anything that a function can do to produce a different result uh, based off a, any given input. So if you give it one input and it doesn't always every single time produce the same output, it's considered a side effect. A pure function, quote unquote, in functional programming, a pure function should return the same result given any particular input. So you pass in A, it should return B every single time you pass in A. And uh, just a side note, it also comes with a get default middleware function, which automatically uh, gives you these three bad boys if you'd like to add your own middleware and still use the provided defaults. Because once you pass in your own middleware, it assumes you, you know what you're doing and it does not automatically give you these three anymore. And so you can basically imagine this function as a placeholder for those three middlewares. Now, Toolkit also makes code more readable, testable, and easier to reason about by running Immer under the hood. If you're not familiar with Immer, it is basically a uh, JavaScript library that allows you to write code in a mutative way, such as with .push, 
instead of having to make copies of things and editing the copies, which is typical of functional programming. So you might notice that this is what our syntax looks like. You might notice this is a key value pair. The key is new post. The value is a arrow function with a state and an action, very similar to the switch statements you're probably used to in vanilla Redux. And what this does is it, it's supplied to the create slice helper function and it will generate all your action creators and action types for you based off you know these reducers that you pass in so new posts will become the action type and the reducer and i'll cover that in more detail if that seems vague right now um, and the really awesome thing is you don't have to import the Emmer library and you can just go ahead and start writing things in a very readable, understandable way um, without having to worry about copying all of your objects and your arrays to avoid mutating them directly, which will cause bugs for sure. I firsthand experienced this when I was creating my Pokedex application. I was uh, mutating an array on accident and uh, it was producing some undesirable effects. So in general, uh, functional programming avoids this and the whole Redux library avoids this and enforces that with the provided middleware, Redux immutable state invariant and serializable state invariant middleware. Now, beyond Toolkit, assuming you're using React, which it's okay if you're not, just kind of ignore me for the next minute or so, um, if you're using React, you can simplify Redux even further with React hooks. If you're familiar with vanilla Redux, you're probably familiar with having some really verbose map state to props and map dispatch to props and the connect function, which is a curried function that has two sets of brackets and one of them takes in the map state to props and dispatch to props and one of them takes your your uh, components, your React component, and then it, then you have to map your your props. You have to, you, you get the picture. There's a lot of stuff going on to get your React component to take in data from your store and to dispatch to the reducers in that store. Well, before that was before React hooks. After React hooks, we got the React Redux use dispatch and use selector hooks and boy do they change things so now with two lines essentially ignoring the imports because obviously you do have to import your your given actions so like in this example my action would have to be imported from the create slice uh, that we have created in a separate file and uh, yeah, with two lines, essentially, you can dispatch any given action creator, which will trigger the reducer and you can send it your your payload. If you're familiar with actions, they they have a type and they have a payload. And so you just send it your payload and basically got two lines and you're good to go. And then as far as accessing the state, now this is not the ideal method uh, as informed to me by uh, Mark. Erickson of the Reactiflux Discord. I'll give him a quick shout out because he's a very helpful individual. And uh, he will probably address any of your concerns. Um, if you join the Reactiflux Discord, it's a very helpful community. Helped me learn a tremendous amount. That's him right here, Ace Mark. And um, if, if you ask anything in the Redux, channel of the Reactiflux Discord. I'm going to put a link for it in the YouTube description. Um, you're probably going to get answers right away. Okay, very helpful community. And what Mark Erickson told me is uh, you basically want to, you can do it just like this, right? You have use selector and then that has state and it returns state dot whatever slice you're looking at dot whatever variable you're trying to get off your state. And so rather than destructuring it in this particular manner here, what you would want to do is you would want to just do 
const my state variable equals use selector state state dot my slice dot my state variable right because then you're accessing that exact variable specifically and so you won't trigger any unnecessary re-renders we might go into that a little bit further but for now just know that use selector is going to save you a tremendous amount of time you would be mapping your state to props and all that shenanigans it allows you to basically say hey i know what my state looks like it has a bunch of slices it has slice one slice two and then it has some variables that contain arrays and whatever shenanigans i want and i can access that directly so the first thing you do is you set up your redux store and this is a little bit of an anecdote redux toolkit helped me shift my mental model for what state looks like by teaching me this concept of slices i i already knew most of us know you, your state is basically like a big huge object that has a bunch of key value pairs that contain arrays and strings and numbers and whatever you want to put on there essentially that is serializable and I never really thought about each one of those slices, so to speak, as separate chunks of data representing different features. Redux Toolkit enforces this mental model. Um, well, it doesn't necessarily enforce it strictly, but I mean, you have this function called create slice and they recommend that you name each of your files that utilize that function as a slice file. So for example, if we're just, you know, calling everything exactly what it is, you can imagine your state object as having a slice one and slice two. Those are two different features. This one might be for users and whatever users can do with your app. This one might be for admins and what admins can do with the app. And each of those slices have all the different data that you want to obtain. And as we saw previously, you can grab that data with the React Redux use selector hook, just like this, very simply. So in this ex particular example, if we wanted to get access to this array in data, we would say const data equals use selector state returns state dot slice one, because that's where the data is located that we're, we're trying to obtain this array here. So state dot slice one dot data and that's all you have to do and you've you've got access to it no mapping state and dispatch to props each slice is recommended to have a to be responsible for a different feature as i've just uh, talked about earlier uh, in vanilla redux we sort of do this already by separating our logic out into numerous reducer files and then making one redu reducer, which uses combined reducers to, to combine them all. Well, Redux Toolkit kind of does that for you by using the configure store function. And uh, so yeah, without any more further ado, that's all kind of like a preamble. Hopefully it wasn't too vague. Um, every journey basically begins with creating your Redux store. It's kind of a chicken or the egg problem because to use the store, you do still need a reducer and to use the reducer, you need the store. So whatever you prefer, do it your own way, whatever makes you happy. I personally create the store first and this is exactly what that's gonna look like. So for this flashcard application that you just saw, we have a Redux folder and you don't necessarily have to do that. That's just how I do it. And in that folder, we have store.ts. And that's because we're using TypeScript for this file. No worries if you don't use TypeScript, I'm gonna explain it along the way. I do suggest you use it and so does the Redux community. And it's not called HypeScript for anything, for any reason. It is definitely going to aid you in your journey of learning JavaScript. So we have our store.ts or store.js. It imports the configure store. And now you don't have to import this, by the way, this is just for demonstration purposes, uh, but you can also import the Git default middleware from Redux Toolkit. Then we import our either our root reducer that we've created separately and ran combine reducer on, which I personally do not recommend because I think that's a little bit more verbose and um, the configure store will do that for you, uh, but you can do whatever you like. 
Uh, there are benefits to it, I'm sure. And you create your store and you assign the store to the configure store function, which takes in a configuration object. And in that configuration object, we have our reducer key, a middleware key, a dev tools key, a preloaded state key, and there's a couple more that you can see on the official API documentation here, Redux Toolkit .js.org, blah, 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 blah. So you'll see that in the uh, YouTube description. So if you have any questions on how the API works, you can read it from the official source. This is what it looks like in our application. And uh, what this does is this reducer key accepts an object that has all of your slices of state. So we've got our flashcards slice, and we've got our favorite cards slice. And in them, you just simply pass your reducer. Now, in this example, I've made it a little more verbose than it is necessary. You could even simplify it further by, since this is a, uh, a default export, I could just simply call it flashcards. And then I could say reducer flashcards, and I wouldn't have to do anything else, just so that you're aware. I just did this to kind of show you guys um, how everything is working and how each of these reducers are like a separate slice responsible for a different feature in your application. And normally, typically, if you're not doing anything super advanced, that's all you have to do. Configure store, pass it in an object with a key that has reducer and your uh, slice reducers and you're done. Because middleware and dev tools happen by default. If you'd like to change the default, you can also supply a middleware key and you can pass in an array that has the get, get default middleware if you are interested in using the middleware that they supply, which is Redux Thonk, Mutable State Invariant, and Serializable State. And you can, you can do it that way. For this particular example, all I am using is the default middleware. So this is redundant, but I just wanted to show you what it looks like. Also, you can control whether or not you want to turn on and off dev tools. Not sure why you'd want to turn it off. Um, it is a wonderful thing. I mean, maybe for production, you know, turn it off for production. Uh, not that it really matters too much. Um, but yeah, so you can control the dev tools here and you can also configure the middleware and the dev tools in here. And you can read about that more in the official API documentation. You can also pass in a preloaded state if you'd like to manually rehydrate your state or initialize it to any particular values. But as you'll see shortly, you can also do that with your state slices. So it's kind of up to you how you want to do that. Then you export your store and you're done. So I may have been re really long winded and talked for an hour, but this is going to take you 10 seconds to set up. And typically it's just going to say reducer and your reducers, and then you export that bad boy and you're done. And you don't have to make a separate reducer file unless you want. And then now this is TypeScript. So if we, th this helps you a little bit later on um, so that you have a type to assign to the state. So you export type root state is equal to return type type of store dot get state. And that's going to be, uh, you know, your flashcards and your favorite flashcards and all that. And uh, I'm kind of a TypeScript beginner myself. I just use it to give me more errors so that I can learn faster. Um, so if you spot some things that we can improve upon, feel free to let me know. Um, and yeah, you don't have to use TypeScript, but I do recommend it. So Pretty much already talked about all that. So how do we structure our files? So Redux Toolkit suggests that we switch our uh, mental model for arranging our files into something called the Dux pattern. And la 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 la, that comes from Redux. Very inventive. And that suggests that we store each of our application's features in a separate folder inside a features folder. So in this example, I have features, and then we've got our favorites feature. Like if we wanted to favorite the flashcards, this doesn't really exist in our application. I just wanted to give you an example. And then we've got the flashcard feature, which has a card list component, a create flashcard component, and the flashcard component itself, along with all of its state and reducers, which is called flashcard slice, which I'll go into more detail on. 
This is the Ducks pattern, and it is a little bit more simple because if you're coming from Vanilla Redux, you're probably used to having a constants, uh, types, reducers file, action creators file, and just having a ton of files. Well, really all we have is a store and the slices. That's it if you stick to this simple pattern. And that's going to tremendously reduce the amount of boilerplate you have to write and make things far less verbose. Now let's take a look at an example slice. So our first create slice is just going to be an imagined one because I don't want to overload you with the actual flashcard application state yet. So let's just imagine it. So we import our create slice from Redux Toolkit. We sign it to a variable for exporting. And in this example, I probably should have just called my slice slice name for simplicity's sake. But uh, just know that how you're going to reference this state here in your uh, use selector or however you choose to do it is you're going to reference it by slice name, whatever is in this named field here. And the my slice thing is just for purposes of exporting. So you create the slice and you pass it in an object and that object contains three uh, necessary required values, name, initial state, and reducers. The name is gonna be whatever you wanna call it. You could call it users, you could call it posts, you could call it incremental, whatever, I don't know. You can call it whatever you want, that's gonna be uh, but you want to give it a name that's going to represent all of the different variables that it is responsible for. Because inside that slice name, you're going to have this initial state, which in this example is just a do stuff and a more stuff. And do stuff is a array that has a string in it. And I'm telling you in, in here how we will access these values in different areas of our application. So for example, Outside of this slice file, if we wanted to access this do stuff array and get the string inside it, the exact way that we would do that is with use, yeah, I'll show you, with use selector as, uh, as I showed you before, use selector state, and then it will return state dot slice name dot do stuff, which is an array. And then we use the zero index because there's only one item in the array and it is this string. So state dot slice name dot do stuff zero would access this string. On the other hand, if we wanna access this information from within this create slice file, such as in a reducer that's in this file, we could say simply state dot more stuff and it'll return it. We don't have to tell it what slice name it is because it already knows because it's inside of this object. And then the biggest change you're gonna see from writing reducers is that not only are they passed into this create slice helper function, but they are uh, they look kind of like just normal everyday functions rather than switch and case statements. Not only that, but as I informed you earlier, you can write mutative logic in them, such as dot .push, to, to, that would normally cause bugs. Instead of worrying about using spread operators and dot .concat and stuff like that, writing extra unnecessary lines of code and making it a little bit less readable, just write state dot .do stuff dot .push and push whatever you want onto that array. Very, very easy. Immer takes care of making that mutative uh, code into non-mutative code under the hood for you and you don't even have to think about it. Inside this reducers object, we can pass in any number of reducer functions that we want. I'm using arrow syntax, which I hope you're familiar with. Um, if you're not, just kind of brush up on ES6 a little bit. Uh, and uh, as you know, reducers have a state and an action per, uh, parameter that they, or I'm sorry, arguments that they take in. And um, 
the action is going to be optional. So in this example, I don't do anything with the action. So that's how you use create slice. And the magic that happens with create slice is once you pass in that information, you export it all down here and it looks just like this. You just say export, and this is destructuring syntax from ES6 again, and it you export whatever the name of the reducers that you have are, and it automatically makes them into action creators. So you can dispatch, you know, delete flashcard, for example, and it will automatically dispatch an action of type dispatch flashcard, which will automatically trigger the reducer called delete flashcard and whatever logic is in there to go ahead and change your state. And all of this happens for you automatically. This is a huge time saver. You can also export the reducer itself. Now these are nicknamed case reducers in case you're wondering. Um, and the reason why is because they're, you know, reminiscent of the switch in case statements. They're also called that literally if you want to uh, reference one of these reducers from within a reducer. So like in this official example from the code we're actually going to write, we have a previous flashcard, next flashcard, and they reference something called flashcards.caseReducers.flipflashcard. Well, flip flashcard is right here, right? But to access it, we have to call the name of the slice of state dot case reducers, which is going to be this object of reducers of all our reducers, and then whatever the name of our uh, actual reducer is. And we do need to pass it the state as well, or else it won't have access to it. So you can call one reducer from within another reducer with this syntax, but that's kind of like an aside. It's okay if you don't know that right off the bat. Um, this is kind of more of a like specific use case thing. If you're trying to keep your code super dry, like I was, um, since flip flashcard is used in three different reducers here, uh, that's how I accessed it. Okay, so we won't worry about that too much. Now let's talk a little bit more about these slices. So we've already talked about using use selector to access the data and how easy that can be. And we've already talked about how you can import the names of your action creators, which are the same names as your reducers from your slice. And uh, Redux Toolkit does suggest that you name whatever file uh, responsible for that feature as whatever the feature is, slice in the name, just you know, for ease of, of remembering everything. And uh, then you can dispatch that action creator, which is also the same name as the reducer. So you can read more about this if you'd like to, you know, read all the things that I've written, go ahead and, you know, go to the Notion article, uh, but I'm just going to keep going here. So now this is what our actual create slice looks like in the application. This is the first half of it. It is a create slice that has a name called flashcards because that's the feature. The feature is flashcards. The initial state is a current value, which keeps track of whatever card is visible, and it is equal to the index of that card in the card array. So card one, for example, is going to have an ID of zero, which is the same as the, the current value, and it's going to have an index of zero in the cards array. Now flipped just keeps track of if we're looking at the front or the back of the card. It's false right now. And so that means we're looking at the front of the card. The cards array contains every single card that we create, and they all have an ID and a front and a back. In the front, they have a title and a content value. The title is optional, the content is not. On the back, it's the same thing. The title is optional. In this case, it's just an empty string. And the content, again, is not optional. And this, is, this can be enforced by TypeScript as well. So hopefully this is not too hard to understand. It's just our initial state object for the flashcards state. So to access it, it would be flashcards dot whatever or state dot flashcards 
dot cards if we wanted to access this array, for example. Then we create our case reducers, which replace the old fashioned switch and case statements. And this is every single reducer that runs that entire flashcard application that you were just looking at. So feel free to pause the video if you wanna analyze this logic. You may already be familiar with all of this, uh, but you'll notice one thing right away, it's very readable and it is very, uh, simple like there's there's not very many lines of code it's not very verbose there's no copying of anything because Xamarin is running under the hood and um, basically we can when we click our next button it triggers next flash card when we click the previous button it triggers previous flash card um, we flip our flash card uh, before we change them if they're looking at the back because we always want them looking at the front of the flash card whenever they they look at a new one so we have some conditional logic here saying, if they're looking at the back of the card, flip it before changing the current card to the next card. That's essentially how this is working. And we have our create flash card, which basically just takes an object. And the object is the same shape as our flash card initial state. It has an ID, it has a front and a back with title and content in both. And we push that card right on to the cards array. And the way that we do that, it, now in Redux Toolkit, one thing to keep in mind, you may be familiar hopefully with action.payload. There's action.type and action.payload. In Redux Toolkit, the naming convention is enforced. It is always called action.payload because the, you know, that's just what they all agreed was going to be the easiest way to keep track of everything rather than calling it all these arbitrary variables. Now you can destructure the payload to be whatever you want. Now in this example, I do action.payload.id. I add an ID to the payload before I push it onto the cards array. Now I could have said, you know, uh, card const card equals action not payload, right? And then I could have done that to make it even more readable. So, you know, it's up to you how you want to deal with the payload, but it's always called payload and it's gonna contain whatever data you want. And generally speaking, you want to make the data into the proper shape inside of the reducer, unless it is very convenient for you, such as in this application for you to do it outside of the reducer. So since I'm just using a form, I get to control what the shape of the data is anyway. And so it just conveniently comes in in the exact shape that it needs to be, which is with a front and a back and an ID as you just saw. And then of course you can delete the flashcard. And feel free to look into this code more in depth. Again, this is not a, a tutorial on how to create a flashcard app. It's a tutorial on why Redux Toolkit is gonna change the way you look at Redux. And the magic that we already looked at earlier is it's going to take every single one of these reducers and turn them into action creators automatically for you and manage their types for you. And their types are accessible explicitly if for some crazy reason you, you want to do that. Uh, read more into the toolkit documentation. But for most use cases that I've encountered so far, you don't really need to do that. You just export flashcards.actions. Keep in mind, flashcards is the name supplied to the create slice function. So the name flashcards and we export flashcards dot actions and whatever actions we want to export. Now, these can be imported in any other file in the application and they will you can then dispatch these actions and they will perform whatever, uh, you know, whatever code that you've put in here. So the last step is to wrap the entire application in a provider component, assuming you're using React. If you're not, uh, you're gonna have to look at subscriptions and, and things like that. I'm actually not too familiar with it because I'm really big on uh, React right now. And so that's just how I do it. Uh, React uh, Redux provides you with a provider uh, component that you wrap your application in. So you do provider, app probably already familiar with that and then you just pass the store in so nothing's changed in that regard redux toolkit does not change how you will pass in this store into your app 
So you wrap your app in that, and then you can access the state anywhere in the application. Now, this next part may look a little funky to you because this is where the, the TypeScript starts to come into play a little bit more. And um, don't worry about it. Basically, anything that comes after a colon is a type, if you're unfamiliar, uh, such as like const app colon react.fc means that the app arrow function here is a React functional component. And so, yeah, don't get too caught up on the TypeScript if you're not familiar. Um, it just helps a lot in learning new libraries and it will help you to catch some errors. So again, I do suggest you use TypeScript and so does the Redux uh, community for the most part. So we create our dispatch variable here and assign it to use dispatch, which again, we import from the React Redux library. We make our cards equal to use selector state, and then we return state dot whatever our slice is. In this case, it's flashcards dot whatever value we're looking for, which in this case is an array called cards. So now I have access to this array of cards in a variable called cards. We create another variable called current, which just keeps track of whatever the current card is that we're looking at. Now we're using React Router. Hopefully this isn't too confusing for you. If you haven't used Router, that's what this route is. And um, it's not too big of a deal if you don't know what that is. Uh, let's just focus on the Redux code. And uh, so basically we take this cards array here and we uh, take our imported, um, above here we have an imports and we're importing the uh, names of the reducers that are next flashcard and previous flashcard. And we just say dispatch and then next flashcard and previous flashcard. And this is essentially our action creator, which you're, you may already be familiar with. And that generates our type, which is typically a string, which people typically define in a constants file and yada yada. So this is saving us a tremendous amount of code, just allowing us to say dispatch, next flashcard, done, right? So I'm essentially passing this as props to my bottom nav component so that when they click the next arrow, it dispatches the next flashcard action creator, which sends the type to the reducer, which triggers the code that says, hey, change the current value to the next value, assuming they're not already looking at the last card. And then here you can see we've got our flashcard displaying in the middle of the screen. It has an ID, which is the current, and it has a front and a back. The front is equal to cards and the index of the, the current card dot front and cards index of the current dot back. So should be pretty easy to reason about. And whenever we change the current value, whatever card is on screen changes as well. So that's pretty, that pretty much sums it up. I know I kind of, you know, went, went on for a long bit on, on some things and maybe not some others. Um, I'm going to break this up into to two parts. So in a little bit, we're going to talk about material UI and how all this is styled and everything, but that's basically all of the, the Redux toolkit in action. So if you're used to coming from vanilla Redux, with all those different files, you're gonna see that just having this little teeny tiny thing, const store equals configure store, pass in your slice reducers, and then you will have your slice reducers in a features folder. And you know they'll have your create slice object, and it will have, you know, like in this example, I, I start off with two cards in the array. And um you have your reducers and it will export all the actions for you automatically guys this is going to save you so much time all the middleware is set up we can we can pull open our redux dev tools and we can look here we can see every time we click this it dispatches the flip flash card action we can compare our state before and after all of that stuff happens automatically for us without us needing to configure anything. Now, again, if this looks foreign to you, make sure you download the Redux DevTools Chrome extension because this is a game changer. It is awesome. Then when we delete, 
Oh, well, we can't delete a card because I'm on the last card. Let's refresh it. When we refresh it, it's going to give an error because, of course, I'm, I'm doing a tutorial, so it's got to make errors for me. And uh, so, yeah, when we in initiate it, we've got our two cards. And when I click Next, it says Next Flash Card. And all that does is change the current value. And we can see it all live in HD. And we can get a play-by-play -play of what's happening with our state. We can analyze it. We can find bugs. We can see areas for improvement. And that, my friends, pretty much sums up Redux Toolkit. So for further information, go ahead and, like I said, uh, get clone this repository from my GitHub, github.com slash Jordan Winslow slash flash dash cards. Go ahead and clone that bad boy. Feel free to, uh, you know, make any pull requests that you want. Uh, you know, I, I do not mind. I already had, uh, let me go ahead and give a quick shout out actually to a very nice fellow, Nick Serve here, um, who went through all of this and added a bunch of TypeScript types to it. Um, and that, you know, really helps us to understand how everything is running under the hood because TypeScript types are kind of like a way of um, just saying what everything should be shaped like. So, you know, we've got our state and that should be shaped like root state. And to see what that looks like, we go to our, root, our Redux store where we define our root state type. And we can look at it and we can see exactly what it is. But when we're in VS Code, we just hover our mouse over that bad boy and it tells us exactly what it is. We've got all these interfaces here. And um, that's all TypeScript stuff. It's really going to save you a lot of time. And thank you very much, Nick Serve, for, for doing that. And uh, yeah, join the Reactive Flux Discord, ask questions in the Redux channel. Uh, everybody's going to help you to understand Redux Toolkit. Um, this should help make Redux a little bit more popular again and eliminate some of these myths that it's too complicated to set up. It's only good for super complicated, large scale applications, yada, yada. Uh, as you can see, Redux is now a lot more simple.